The following message was presented during the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries 2018 Prophecy Conference season. Now here's Bruce Scott with a message from Matthew chapter 24, The Abomination of Desolation. Well, tonight I have the privilege of sharing with you uh, the not-so-great message (laughs) called The Abomination of Desolation. Now, many of you here are old enough to remember what it was like to be a child and to be motivated by fear. You know, adults would would sometimes use the motivation of fear to get you to do something, to obey, to to be good, and uh, sometimes they would talk about the boogeyman. Anybody hear about the boogeyman as you were growing up? Watch out for the boogeyman. He'll come for you if you're not good. The boogeyman. I never, as a child, who's the boogeyman? Who who is that person? All I knew is that he was supposed to be somebody to be feared. You know, for a number of years when I was young, I thought they were were saying the booger man. (laughs) And I thought, wow, that really is scary, the booger man. But uh, there is actually going to be, in the future, a real boogeyman. Someone that is going to be horrible, someone that's going to be murderous, someone that's going to be possessed by the devil. And this real boogeyman is known in the scripture as the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, the beast, or the antichrist. And he will be objectified in the form of an image known as the abomination of desolation. Let's pray together, and then we'll look into the word. Father, we heard tonight in beautiful music about your name. And so we ask you to glorify your name now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. You might have guessed that's where we were going since the whole conference is about the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 through 25. Our passage tonight is verses 15 through 20. So I'll just read those and then we'll go back and we'll take them apart verse by verse. Matthew 24, 15 through 20. The Word of God says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Just get a little context of where we're at now. Jesus is still answering the disciples' questions found at the beginning of the chapter in uh, verse 3. When will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So he's still answering these questions. We saw an overview of the tribulation period and, and now he comes to a very serious and very dramatic event that's going to take place. In verses 15 through 20, what Jesus is doing here is he's giving physical, life-saving instructions to future Jewish people so that, as he says in verse 13, so that they might endure to the end. In other words, that they might stay alive physically until the time when he comes to rescue them after the end of the tribulation period at his second coming. So, how do you endure to the end? He's giving them some life-saving instructions how to do that. So we're going to look at the revelation of the abomination of desolation, and then we're going to look at the response to 
the abomination of desolation. Verse 15, Jesus said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation. So we're going to look at what is the abomination, where is the abomination, and when does it take place? First of all, what is the abomination? The Greek word for abomination generally means something that causes revulsion or extreme disgust. Abomination is frequently used in the Bible to describe what God regards, in contrast to men, as detestable. From man's point of view, hey, it's not so bad. From God's point of view, it's detestable, it's disgusting. Keep your finger there in Matthew. Turn over to Luke chapter 16. You'll see Jesus saying this, specifically in Luke 16, verse 15. The Lord said to the Pharisees, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination, that's our word, an abomination in the sight of God. This is something that's going to be an abomination in the sight of God. Now the abomination of desolation was prefigured by a man in Israel's history known as Antiochus IV, or as he liked to call himself, Epiphanes. Antiochus IV reigned in uh, the area of Israel from 165 to 164 BC. He was a Syrian king, and he forced Hellenization, Greek culture, upon the Jewish people. Antiochus was a vile man. He was cunning. He was deceitful. He was greedy. He was forceful. He was hot-tempered. He was violent. He was cruel. He was irreverent. Other than that, he was a nice guy. He was a terrible man, and he did terrible things to the Jewish people. He was also full of pride and self. He called himself Epiphanes. They have found coins of his image on these coins, and on the coins it says Theos, God, Epiphanes, meaning manifest or glorious. And in 168 B.C., Antiochus took out his rage on the people of Israel and their covenant with God. What did he do? He defiled the temple. How did he defile the temple? Well, he stopped the daily sacrifices. He sacrificed pigs and sprinkled the temple with the broth. And then... He set up his own abomination of desolation, a statue of the Greek god Zeus on the bronze altar outside, right outside the temple building. So the abomination of desolation was prefigured by what Antiochus IV did. It was also predicted by Daniel. Jesus says that, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Keep your finger there in Matthew 24. Turn back to Daniel 11. Daniel 11, verse 31. It says, And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now who is Daniel talking about here? He's not talking about the Antichrist here. In context, historically, he's speaking of Antiochus IV. Now, he was yet future to Daniel when he said these words, but this is actually Antiochus' work. Predicted by Daniel, this abomination of desolation, and then prophetically, Antiochus typifies the Antichrist. You see that in verses 36 and following. Uh, scholars, as they read about Antiochus IV, and they realize this is talking about a historical figure, all of a sudden in verse 36, it seems to meld into another figure that is the antitype of Antiochus, this future person known as the Antichrist. Daniel 11, 36 and following. In Daniel 12, verse 11, it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So here in Daniel 12, 11, Daniel is predicting this future 
abomination of desolation. And he actually speaks of this prince who is to come in Daniel 9.27 who will confirm a covenant with the many of Israel for one week, one week of seven years. And then in the middle of that, he will stop the sacrifices. And on the wing of abominations, it says, he will come. So Daniel does predict of what Jesus speaks of here in Daniel 24. And just as an aside, in contrast to the 21st century liberal theologians, Jesus Christ himself confirms three things by saying what was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. First of all, he confirms that Daniel was a historical person. He wasn't make-believe. There was a, a historical person, Daniel, who was a prophet. Jesus calls him a prophet. And Jesus also confirms Daniel's prophecy. Liberal theologians will say, no, Daniel was a fake person or he was a, it was a pseudonym that someone else was using and he was looking back in history and writing it as if it was prophecy. No, Jesus himself confirms the book of Daniel and his prophecies. We've seen that it was prefigured. The abomination of desolation was prefigured by Antiochus IV. It was predicted by Daniel and it also produces this abomination, desolation. The phrase, the abomination of desolation, is a genitive of product. What does that mean? It means that you can translate it as the abomination that produces desolation. The abomination that produces or which produces desolation. The idea is that the abomination is something so abhorrent that it defiles a place and it causes it to be left desolate. The Greek word for desolation means the state of being made uninhabitable. In fact, Jesus speaks of this in Luke 21, where in parallel passage of Luke, Jesus does answer the question about when will these stones all be overturned? When will this happen? And so in Luke 21, 20, Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. The state of being uninhabitable. So Jesus was speaking of the event in A.D. 70 in Luke. So this is the abomination that produces desolation. So that's what the abomination is. Now, where is it actually going to be placed? Well, Jesus says, when you see it standing in the holy place, the holy place. In Mark 13, 14, Jesus says, standing where it ought not. It shouldn't be there. Where is that place? Well, the word standing, the Greek word has an emphasis less on the fact that it's, it's standing up as much as the emphasis more on it being there, the, exi the existence of it, the presence of it being there where it ought not to be. The phrase, the holy place, is used in a number of passages generally to refer to the temple area, the temple mount compound where the temple building, the holiest place for the Jewish people, was located. But specifically, I would hold that it is referring to, in this context, to the priest's courtyard, which is immediately outside the temple building. You know, inside the temple building, you first of all enter the holy place, and then behind the veil is the holy of holies. Well, that's the temple building. Outside of the temple building, you have, what, the bronze altar, the, the laver, all of these things right there in that area is where I would uh, submit is this location where the abomination of desolation will be set up. So this is the priest's courtyard right outside the building, uh, the uh, holy place and the holy of holies. Here's a closer look. And in that area is where the bronze altar is located. I believe that's most likely the place where the abomination of desolation will be set up. 
Uh, you can read how in Acts thir- uh, 6, verse 13, and Acts 21, 28, you can see how that phrase, the holy place, is used to refer to the whole temple area. The Septuagint, the Old Testament Greek translation, uh, uses this phrase, the holy place, referring to who can ascend, who has the, the righteous authority to ascend to God's holy place in Psalm 24, verse 3. But turn to Leviticus chapter 6. Turn to Leviticus chapter 6, and you'll see something interesting there. This, this is where I, I base my my assumption that this uh, abomination of desolation will be placed. This is back in the days of the tabernacle now, and the temple was based similarly on the structure of the tabernacle. But in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 16, they're talking about where Aaron and his sons will eat some of these sacrifices and, and offerings. Leviticus 6, 16 says, And the remainder of it Aaron and his sons shall eat. With unleavened bread, it shall be eaten in a holy place. There's our phrase. In the court of the tabernacle of meeting, they shall eat it. So they won't be eating it inside the temple building or the tabernacle uh, uh, structure itself, but in the courtyard of it. So if you look at uh, verse 26, also of Leviticus 6 and also Leviticus 14, 13, uh, you'll see some similar Uh, phraseology there. So, I think the uh, abomination of desolation will most likely be not in the temple building itself, but right outside of it. In fact, very similar to what Antiochus IV did. Where did he put his statue of Zeus? On the bronze altar, which is right outside the temple building. The place of sacrifice is where he'll do it. Now, when is the abomination going to take place? Jesus is not referring to the abomination of desolation set up by Antiochus IV. That had already happened historically. The abomination of desolation is yet future. Jesus is speaking of what's going to happen in the future from his point of reference. So since Jesus is speaking of the future, the abomination of desolation could really only take place in uh, in two time periods. One, when Herod's temple is still in existence, the second temple, the temple that Jesus was referring to with his disciples, that was standing up until A.D. 70, or in a future rebuilt temple, because the one in A.D. 70 was destroyed. Well, the events in Matthew 24 did not occur while the second temple, Herod's temple, was still standing. You can't just say, well, Jesus is referring to A.D. 70. Well, you have to say, well, all of these other things had to occur in A.D. 72, and they did not, unless you interpret them figuratively. If you interpret them literally and normally, like you're supposed to, then you'll come to the conclusion, Jesus can't be talking about A.D. 70. He has to be talking about the abomination of desolation that must occur in a future rebuilt temple. This future rebuilt temple will be in place at least by the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation period, otherwise known as the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So how do we know that this future rebuilt temple has to be in place at least by that midpoint? Well, we know this because you cannot stop sacrifice and offerings without a temple. This prince who is to come in Daniel 9.27, who stops the sacrifice at the midpoint of the week, well, you can't have a, a real temple or a real sacrifice if there's not a temple there, at least according to biblical law. And we also know that the man of sin, listed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he cannot sit in the temple of God without a temple. So we know that there's going to be a future rebuilt temple, and based on Daniel 12, 11, this abomination will be set up at the same time as the stopping of the daily sacrifice. And when does that occur? According to Daniel 9, 27, right at the midpoint. So that's how we know there has to be a temple at least by 
that time and when this abomination is going to take place. So the what of the abomination, the where of the abomination, and the when of the abomination, what are some other conclusions we can draw? Number one, it's something visible. Jesus said, when you see the abomination. Something visible. Also, it is something separate or distinct from the man of sin, the Antichrist. It is not the Antichrist, it is something separate from him. Notice in Daniel 11.31, it says the abomination is placed in the holy place. Daniel 12.11 says the abomination is set up. However, in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, it says the man of sin goes into the temple himself and he sits down. Nobody picks him up and sets him down somewhere. So this is something different than the Antichrist. It is also an image that is meant to be worshipped, an idol in other words. You can see in 2 Chronicles 15, 8, where good king Asa destroys the abominable idols. It's the same word in the Hebrew as Daniel eleven thirty one 31 and 12, 11, where Good King Asa, it says in 2 Chronicles 15, 8, when Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin. Same word, same idea. It's an abomination to God because it is an idol that is set up to take God's place and is to be worshipped by human beings. In fact, it is identical with the image of the beast that is made during the tribulation period, which according to Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15, all the world will be required to worship the beast and his image on pain of death, if you don't. The presence of the image of the beast in the temple consequently defiles that area. And it makes it desolated or uninhabitable by any true worshipers. That is why it is the abomination which produces desolation. It is not the sign of Jesus' second coming in the end of the age. But it is a kind of red flare or alarm bell, if you will, to warn Jewish people in those future days. When you see this. Jesus said, whoever reads, let him understand. And he said, when you see this, then you do that. When, then. So it's an alarm bell. It's a a red flare. You see that? You're supposed to do something. And that leads us to the response. The revelation of the abomination and now the response to the abomination. And the response is, flee for your life. Flee for your life. Jesus said in verse 16, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You see it? You flee. In fact, the primary verb in the entire passage is this word flee. It means to seek safety in flight. Run. Get out of there as fast as you can. The idea is to run away from danger. It's in the imperative mood, meaning it's a command from Jesus. He's not giving you an option. You know, you see the abomination of desolation? Eh, think about it. No. Run. Flee. Now, in the Greek, the flee, the word, the verb flee is command, and it's in the third person plural. And so English translations often translate it as let those. And when you translate it that way, it's a a perfectly fine translation, but it might imply a softer or permissive command, a suggestion, in other words. You might want to consider, (laughs) that's not what Jesus is saying. On the contrary, the idea is they must flee. I command them to flee. Flee is also in the present tense and carries the idea that they must begin to run And continue to run. Keep those legs turning. Don't stop. So we're going to look at how people are supposed to run and who they are. 
the displaced of the flight, verse 16, those who are in Judea. Now, Jesus could be referring to what was known as Judea in his day, which was a Syrian or satellite uh, part of the Syrian province there in the first century. So Judea was part of a Syrian province. Jesus could have been talking about that, but I don't think so. Most likely, he was talking about all those in the area that was occupied by Jewish people at that time. All the Jewish people in that area of Israel, when you see this happen, this is what you're supposed to do. What's their destination? Where are they supposed to go? He said, to the mountains. Flee to the mountains. Now, apart from Mount Hermon in the northeast of Israel, the only mountains in Israel are the Judean and Samaritan mountains. This is a topographical, topographical map of Israel. The Judean and Samaritan mountains are sort of a north and south spine right in the middle or a little bit to the east of Israel. Average height of the mountains are roughly 2,900 feet. You can see Jerusalem located on that spine of mountains, the Judean and Samaritan mountains. Here's a picture of what some of those mountains look like. They're not like the Rocky Mountains, but you can call them mountains or large hills. Jesus said that's where you're supposed to go. In fact, if you remember the story of Antiochus IV, which sparked the Maccabean Revolt, Mattathias, who was the leader of the Maccabees, and then he passed away and passed uh, the leadership on to Judah, his son, Mattathias and his five sons did the same thing in 168 B.C. After they sparked the revolt, it says in 1 Maccabees 2.28, so he and his sons fled into the mountains and left all that ever they had in the city. Now, it's interesting, in Revelation 12.6, it says, then the woman, meaning Israel, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, some believe, based on Daniel 11.41, that the place prepared for Israel by God will be in Petra, which is in biblical Edom and modern-day Jordan. Now, you can see on this map the Judean and Samaritan mountains that, where Jerusalem is located, and then Petra, which is all the way southeast of there. 80%, over 80% of Israel's current population lives in the non-mountainous areas of Israel. The Judean Samaritan mountains would certainly be closer than Petra if they were going to flee somewhere. So we don't know if it's going to be Petra. We don't know if it's just going to be somewhere that God has pre prepared for them in the mountains. All we know for sure is that Jesus commands these future Jewish people to flee to the mountains. That's where they're supposed to go. The desperation of the flight is in verses 17 and 18. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Uh, the, this command that Jesus is saying here, these are imperatives, he, he's telling them how they are supposed to flee. There's a sense of urgency, of speed, time, and quickness is of the essence. And they're on a very personal, individual type of level. They cover every situation. If you're at home or if you're away from home, this is what you're supposed to do. The first command, he says, don't go down to take anything out of his house. So the person's still at his home. If he's on the housetop, and the housetop was used very regularly back in ancient days, they had to have a parapet around the, the roof of the house for safety purposes, according to Deuteronomy 22.8. But Jesus was saying, if you're on, even on top of your house, Flee, and the purpose of it is to prevent you from taking the time for mere things in the house. Don't go back and try to get the things that you think are most important because your life is more important than your possessions. It's like escaping a burning building. The situation will be so urgent, so intensely dangerous, you should leave everything behind everything you possess, even food for the journey, and just jump or climb down off of the roof and run for your life. The second command where Jesus says, don't go back if you're in the field, do not go back to get his clothes. It's directed to a person who's away from home, most likely working. The word clothes there is singular, 
and it speaks of an outer garment that you would remove if you were doing some sort of task, like when Jesus in John 13, 4 removed his outer garment to wash the disciples' feet, Acts 7, 58, where the witnesses removed their outer garments in order to stone Stephen. The idea is to prevent you from taking the time for even covering. Your life is worth more than your dignity. The situation will be so urgent, so intensely dangerous, that if you are stripped for work, you should not even turn around to get your clothes. Like Joseph in the Old Testament, just leave your garment and run for your life. That's how urgent it's going to be. The difficulty of the flight, verses 19 through 20, Jesus lists four conditions that will make it difficult to flee unencumbered and speedily in those days. Condition number one, if you're pregnant, which is a personal challenge, especially if in, in the latter stages of pregnancy. Number two, if you're nursing a child, which is a nurturing challenge, obviously you want to take care of your child, but taking care of a child takes time and may prevent you from fleeing rapidly. Jesus says, woe to those, meaning how terribly hard or distressful it will be for those people. Condition number three, if it's the winter time, the bad uh, season of uh, weather in Israel, that's an environmental challenge. Uh, this is a, an image, courtesy of NASA, that shows snow on the Judean mountains back in 2013, even in the city of Jerusalem. So Jesus says, that will be a hard condition. If it's a Sabbath day, the Greek doesn't have a, an article there, meaning the Friday to Saturday evening Sabbath. It can be any Sabbath. That'll be a challenge for those who are religious and observant, and they limit themselves to a travel distance. Jesus said that will make it hard. So he said, in order to avoid those last two conditions, you are to pray repeatedly, keep on praying. And this assumes that there will be people who will actually know the word of God and be biblically astute to know that the abomination of desolation is going to happen. So we're going to pray that it doesn't happen in the winter or on a Sabbath. Now, why all of this intense urgency and desperation when the abomination of desolation is seen? Why does Jesus say this? Verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation. You'll have to come back for the next message to find out what that is. In application... Despite the terror of those days, Jesus' words will still ring true to the Jewish people as they flee for their lives. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In fact, we've already seen that God has an unknown place of supernatural refuge prepared for Israel. And God will make sure that Israel gets to that place of refuge with supernatural speed. We're told in Revelation 12, 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. We don't know how God is going to do this, but perhaps God will enable Israel to flee to the mountains as fast as he enabled the prophet Elijah to outrun Ahab's chariot. You remember that? 1 Kings 18, 46, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Perhaps God will give them that power to outrun the danger. The Bible says there will one day be an abomination that produces desolation. But in the midst of that, God will also be watching over Israel, as he promised in Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. 
The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.